Chapter 4, Immigration. Like the other issues discussed in this book, immigration is an issue in which my search for traditional values led me to conclude that people should be allowed to decide for themselves where they live, regardless where they were born. In school, I was taught about the hardworking immigrants who helped build the Transcontinental Railroad, the plight of the immigrants in the slums of New York, and about the immigrants who spent the last of what they had to come to the United States because America was the land of opportunity. I was told about the millions of immigrants who came through Ellis Island being greeted by the Statue of Liberty because they knew they could make a better life in a country with more freedoms. However, I was never taught that there were no federal laws regulating immigration until the passage of the Page Act of 1875, which was introduced to end the danger of cheap Chinese labor and immoral Chinese women. A few years later, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed, which, among other things, prohibited all immigration of Chinese laborers. The Bureau of Immigration, which operated the Ellis Island Immigration Station, was not created until 1891, the year before Ellis Island became the place that nearly 12 million immigrants were processed. Also, like most people, I never thought a lot about the subject for most of my life. Then, in late 1999 and early 2000, the story of Elian Gonzalez made national headlines. Young Elian's mother drowned in November 1999 while attempting to flee Cuba with her boyfriend, son, and 11 others. During the trek from Cuba to the United States, the boat they were on sank and only Elian and two other people survived, floating in inner tubes until they were rescued rescued by two fishermen who turned them over to the U.S. Coast Guard. INS placed Elian in the custody of his paternal great-uncle in Miami, Florida. The situation sparked a national debate with conservatives like Rush Limbaugh saying the boy should stay in the United States with his family and the Clinton administration saying the boy should be returned to his father in Cuba. During the entire debate, I kept asking the question, to which no one seemed to know the answer, what does the law say should happen? Several years later, during national protests, for immigration rights, I asked the question, if these people protesting are here illegally, why are they not arrested? And advocated the position that people wishing to come to the country should simply follow the laws. It was around this time that I began trying to find out the laws. I learned about the quota system and the outrageous fees required for people to move to the supposed land of the free. While working for an airline, I worked with an immigrant from Malawi who told me about the tens of thousands of dollars in fees he'd paid in the previous eight years, and he was still going through the the immigration process. Finally, immigration had become personal. As an aside, I've concluded that most people only change their opinion of an issue when it becomes personal. While working for the airline, I was able to take advantage of flight benefits. I was able to travel, visit historical sites, and learn. One of the first trips I took was to Key West, Florida. While walking around the island, I learned that just months prior to my visit, someone from the city had attempted to annex an abandoned portion of the Seven Mile Bridge. This was done in protest of the official U.S. policy that Cuban immigrants on the bridge still had wet feet under the wet feet, dry feet policy as it applied to Cuban immigrants. This act, while not officially recognized, showed an amazing act of kindness and compassion and again caused me to question my position. A trip a few months later to Ellis Island was the tipping point in causing me to completely change my position. For it was there in New York that I learned of the history of immigration laws in the United States and of the blatant racism that was the rationale behind so many of the laws restricting and or prohibiting immigration into the United States. During my tenure on the National Committee of the Boston Tea Party, the party adopted a program plank stating, end the immigration fiasco. Rather than suddenly decide to enforce long ignored immigration laws, the United States should open its borders to trade and travel. We should loosen restrictions on citizens and visitors alike, allowing people of many backgrounds and cultures to coexist in a society of social and economic freedom and prosperity. The Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Border Patrol agencies at all levels of government should be abolished and dismantled immediately. Current federal immigration laws are convoluted and give preferential treatment to individuals from certain countries. It relies on quotas, host, and in some cases an immigration lottery, as well as preferred treatment to athletes and refugees. This must change and there should be one uniform immigration law. I believe the best law to work with is the wet foot, dry foot rule in place for people fleeing Cuba. Under this rule, anyone from Cuba who makes it safely into the United States is allowed to stay. 
However, the aspect of the rule that I don't like is that the Coast Guard patrols the waters looking for people with wet feet in order to redirect them back to Cuba. As a supporter of voluntary human interaction, I believe that people should be allowed to travel, live, and work wherever they wish. This includes the right of people to move from the country in which they were born to another country without the need to jump through legislative hoops and hurdles. The immigration policy of the United States of America should once again resemble the words written on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tire. Your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door.